Hi, it's Robin. This is one of those videos that's about a couple things and I can't decide what the headline is. Is it faster, basic, one line, 10 print found, or introducing benchmark basic. So I was looking around the retro computer groups on Facebook and someone had posted one of the standard variations on the classic 10 print. You probably know, but here it is. Go to 10. Yeah, I don't think I've talked about 10 print for at least a few months, so we're due. So if you run that program, you get this maze-like pattern. And just in case you don't know how it works, either you're printing character 205, which on the Commodore 64 is a graphic character that looks like a slash that away, or Character 206 right next to it goes the other direction. And this little bit here, 205.5, and add a random value from 0 to 1, means that half the time this will get rounded down to 205, and the other 206, thus randomly choosing one of those two slashes, it gets printed on the screen, and then go to 10 just sends in an endless loop, and it'll just run forever making these sort of patterns. Now, as a reply to that comment, Alex Johnson posted a variation. I'll just type it in here. Line one, A equals 205.5. So it's assigning it to a variable instead of a constant value. And then we're going to print character string A plus random A. And then semicolon, colon, go to two. So let's try that. And yeah, it makes the same pattern, but I think it no runs noticeably faster. In fact, it's almost twice as fast. Okay, so how does that work? My old line 10 is still in there, but that's okay. It wasn't getting executed. The go to two is just an endless loop and line 10 was never reached. So why is this one faster? Well, the thing that really slows down the line 10 version is that this 205.5 is stored as a text string in basic memory. And the basic interpreter reparses that and converts into a floating point number every time through this loop. So that actually takes quite a while. So what Alex has done is instead by assigning it to a variable, the parsing happens once. And then as line two repeats, it just recalls that variable that's already been parsed. And that is almost all the savings right there. So instead of the program taking 14 or 15 seconds to fill the screen, it only takes about eight. And a smaller improvement is instead of the random one parameter, that can be any positive number. It doesn't really affect the function of the random at all. It always as long as it's a positive number, it always returns a value from zero up to one non-inclusive. So it stays using the A parameter, it's already been parsed, but of course it doesn't take as long to parse a one anyway. So the A is a small improvement. That's probably about half a second worth of improvement there. And the other six or seven seconds of improvement are coming from this main 205.5 use here. Okay, so I'll get rid of line 10. I just kept it there for comparison. This is a great speed improvement. And the only thing I don't like about it is that it does take two lines. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but I just really like the challenge of getting a neat program like Temperant and several others I featured on my channel, keeping it in that one line constraint. Just, I find it fun. I think I'm not the only one. So why can't this just be on one line of code? Well, if we just, for example, change this here, I'll just add that to the beginning of line two. We'll get rid of line one, and then we'll list the program. And now this works fine, but you can probably see it's quite a bit slower again. And the reason is that that 205.5 is getting parsed every time, just like originally. So the trick is here, how can we use a pre-parsed variable, so to speak, like this, but still just do it in one line of code? Seems tricky. I'm sure some of you see the answer already, but bear with me.
So I do have some ideas how we can improve this, but before we start talking about them, I want to introduce the other topic in this video, which I'm calling Benchmark Basic. Pretty cool name? Well, don't get too excited. It's mostly a proof of concept, but it does work well enough for today's purposes. So just to explain something first, in past videos, I've shown how we can benchmark programs by initializing this special TI string variable. That's a system variable, and you can use it to set the system clock, which by the way, isn't battery backed up or anything, so it gets lost when you power down. But if you want to set the time to uh, 12 p.m. and 10 minutes and 43 seconds, that's how you would do it. But just by setting it to six zeros, you're resetting the clock back to zero as if it's midnight, and the system will start counting 60ths of a second from that moment, which is useful for timing. And then if we do a for next loop, like for i equals one to a thousand, and then we'll just do something like, let's just increment X by one. It doesn't matter what to do. We can just put whatever our benchmarking code is inside next. And then when we're done, we'll go T equals TI. So that's just assign the current number of jiffies to the T variable. And then we can print current value of T. We can even show T divided by 60 to convert from jiffies, which are 60ths of a second in C64 speak. Yes, I know jiffies mean other things in other operating systems, but we can convert to seconds with T divided by 60. And then finally, we'll just print X out just to see what the result was. Okay, so let's run that. It takes a few seconds. And we'll see that it took 239 jiffies, which is just shy of four seconds. And indeed, it correctly incremented X 1,000 times. So in the previous video, which I'll put a link in the video description, I'd use this to show that if we convert these floating point variables, which C64 basic defaults to, into integer variables by adding this percent sign afterwards, and we'll just add it down here too. Intuitively, you might think that integer variables would be faster than floating point variables. So let's benchmark that. And we'll run it. And we'll see we've actually taken longer, 278 jiffies or 4.63 seconds, to do the same thing with integer variables. Now, this video isn't really about why, but the short answer is C64 basic had to be squeezed, is made by Microsoft. It had to be squeezed into just eight or nine K of code. And floating point back then was both a luxury and then became a priority. Because of the limited ROM space, they actually had to just kind of make a very weak version of integer variables, which are actually stored as floating point variables. So every time you use an integer variable, it's actually converting it back or forth from its floating point internal format. And the other thing, it just actually takes a little bit longer to parse those percentage signs each time. So integer variables on C64 basic and many other early Microsoft basics are actually slower. But the real point here is just this little framework that we've created allows the C64 to time itself. So you don't need to use a stopwatch or or whatever. It's a nice way of benchmarking. Even if this isn't perfectly accurate, at least it's quite consistent. You might get a little bit of a wiggle of one or two jiffies at times, but overall it's a pretty accurate way of just comparing code A to code B, which is faster. So this works fine for programs like this, but it does limit the program to this format. So if we're testing a one-liner, then the TI string would get initialized every time the program, like if you had to squeeze that TI string into the one line of code, then it would get reset every time it wouldn't work. So you can work around that. For example, we could change this to line 60 and I could add a line 55 to end. Uh, and we can also add here a go to 20 and we can delete line 10. That was convoluted, wasn't it? And the point is we can kind of take the TI 
reset out of the beginning of the program because it actually affects timing the closer to the beginning of the program you are in certain cases. At least it does for go to's. So if we run 60, it'll actually execute this part first and then jump up. Let's see that. So it, I guess you can work around that part, but it still leaves the major problem of the program having to have a set number of loops, which either requires a for next loop or a, a counter with an if then. And so by its very nature, you can't benchmark something like our 10 print program that's an endless loop. You have to modify the program you're trying to benchmark to benchmark it, and therefore you're affecting the result. You're actually having to alter your code to suit the benchmark and not the optimization. So that's a problem. And after all that preamble, that's where Benchmark Basic comes in. So in the video description, there'll be a link to D64 that includes not only Benchmark Basic, but the Turbo Macro Pro source code. So you can look at it if you want to, but this video won't be about the actual source code. We're just going to use it as a tool to optimize 10 print. Can we make a faster one line 10 print? So once you've mounted that D64, just load in Benchmark Basic. It's important to load it comma eight comma one. And then to start it, don't type run, but instead sys 49152. And you'll see it's prompted with B basic, stands for benchmark basic. So that's instead of a ready prompt, it'll say that. That's inspired by Jim Butterfield's banana demo, where he changed the ready prompt to say banana. But uh, that joke got a bit old. I actually had that in the first version of this program, but even the best jokes eventually aren't funny. Okay, so to use Benchmark Basic, once you've done that sys49152, just type in your program. So we'll just do the classic 10 print again here that we were just looking at. Enlist it to make sure it's good. And let's run it. And away it goes. You see it automatically cleared the screen for you. That's part of giving it like a standardized start. So it's always starting with a blank screen top left corner fills the screen and then when it scrolls, it automatically stops the program and prints out the number of jiffies it took to run and also calculates the number of seconds if you prefer that as your benchmark. And then you can list the program and there it is. You can just edit it, you know, tweak it with a, what your next idea for an optimization is and then rerun. And that's the whole cycle. It's very quick and convenient. At least I found it that way. Okay, so let's try some optimizations. First, we'll try crunching the program, which just means eliminating all the space, all the white space. <laughs> this is something I do naturally. I know it drives some of you nuts. This is what was actually recommended in the Commerce 64 Programmer's Reference Guide and User Guide. Okay, so we were at 874 Jeffies. We'll try running. Doesn't look much faster. Okay, 872. So it might have saved a jiffy. Again, there might be a wiggle of a jiffy or two. So the verdict is crunching does almost nothing as a speed optimization. Uh, it does save a few bytes though. Well, in this case, two bytes. Okay, but a bigger improvement, as I said, you can use any positive number as the parameter here. So actually using pi should speed it up a bit. We were at 872 jiffies. That's a little faster. So pi is a positive number, you know, 3.14 or whatever. 3.141529. Oop. Okay, so now we're at 829 jiffies. That saved about 40 jiffies or two thirds of a second. By the way, if you happen to run this on a PAL C64, you'll find all the results are approximately 3% slower. And that's because of the differences in PAL machines. The clock speed's a little slower. But another improvement we can make is instead of using random pi, change it to random zero. Now this has the negative consequence of making the random number generator slightly less random. It actually just is a shorter repeating cycle, but I don't think it makes any visual or visible difference for this kind of program like Temprint. So that is a speed up there. So we were at what, 829 jiffies, all the way down to 600. 
an 83. So I'm not actually sure why random zero is that much quicker than random one. Does it just take that much less time to parse the zero? But if we try random dot, that actually gets interpreted as a zero. The reason for that, if you have a number like 5.5, the dot is the decimal point. Well, if you just put a dot on its own, it just interprets it as a 0, 0.0. So that's why just dot will work. And it actually parses it even quicker. We'll try that. Down 649 jiffies, another 30 jiffies or half a second. I think we have one more optimization. If we delete line 10 and just edit it to line zero, not only go to zero, we can actually drop the line number altogether. And that's because go to with no parameter just goes to line zero. It's almost like a quirk. I'm not even sure it was designed that way, but it, it does work that way. Okay, so let's try running that. And we were at what, 649 jiffies or so. And now we're down to 634, another quarter second or so. I think this is the fastest that we can make the classic 10 print in this form. I don't see any other room for improvement besides actually changing the algorithm a little, so to speak. So you see Benchmark Basic is basically a highly specialized test environment, makes it easy to get standardized timing results for this specific type of program. It's really not that big of a deal, but I, I found it fun to play with. I like how suited it is for this particular kind of optimization. And I just like that you can make your program as streamlined as possible, and you don't have to worry about saying TI string or doing any of that other stuff. And it does it in a very light way because it's just doing very specific patching, soft patching of the basic ROM and the kernel ROM. It's not doing any kind of other monitoring. So by doing these patches at very specific points, it's able to do this with basically no overhead at all. Okay, so if that's as fast as we can make this version, let's try benchmarking Alex's version. So again, that's A equals 205.5, and line two, we just print character string A plus random A, semicolon, colon, go to two. I see he's already crunched it there. Let's try running that. I can see how much faster it is right away. Okay, so 482 jiffies, quite a bit faster in just eight seconds. So this is already about three seconds faster than the best I could get what we were just looking at. So let's see what else we can do to it. We can do a little bit of that cheating here by changing line two into line zero. And we'll add a go to at the end of line one. And so now the line zero is a tighter loop because of the elimination of go to two, but the consequence is we have to run one. Which I don't really like doing, but I don't really like two line programs either. So we'll just see how fast we can get this. Okay, so 471, that just saved about 10 jiffies, about six of the second, but we can do more. We can change that random A into the random dot. Let's try that, run one, gotta remember that. Even faster. 274 jiffies, four and a half seconds. That might be the fastest possible right there. But because I know some of you will bring this up, there is one more trick. We can do something called unrolling. If you think of this loop, this endless loop as a roll, it does one thing, print a character, and then it does a go-to. Well, that go-to is essentially overhead. No actual work, the printing is getting done. Unrolling just means eliminating at least some of a loop so that less time is spent in the overhead of actually looping back and more in just the doing. This is a common technique in a lot of uh, video games or C64 demos, often done where there's a whole bunch of work to do that a loop would do well, but the overhead burns extra cycles that it needs to scroll the screen at an acceptable frame rate, for example. Anyway, how do you unroll in basic? 
Well, unfortunately, it means that we have to retype this line and we'll just do abbreviate. So I'll put a question mark for the print C shift H. Actually, I'll switch to lowercase here just so it's easier. C shift H is the shortcut or the abbreviation for character string. A plus R shift N for random bracket dot to closing bracket semicolon colon. And instead of go to, I am going to laboriously type this in over and over again. Oh, how I wish instead of this basic, I had made a copy and paste for C64 basic. That'd be something, eh? Did, did anybody ever make that? This is really painful. I'm doing this for you guys. I'm doing this for science. I'm doing this for the love, for the likes. Oh boy. Semicolon, colon. Okay, that's all the unrolling I can fit in here. Now I have to just fit the go to G shift O. We didn't actually have to abbreviate that. Okay, let's try listing that. I really hope I didn't miss anything because when I run, it'll uh, clear the screen, shout really loud if I missed anything. Oops. It just a syntax error because I typed over it. Okay, I'll switch that back to uppercase and then we will run one. There it goes. That is fast. 254 jiffies. That might be the fastest temperant I have ever seen. Okay, so that's very fast. The only thing is, as I said, I want it to be one line. So let's try that. We'll start just by setting A to 205.5. But now how do we go to, or how do we loop without going back to the beginning of line zero? Well, some of you have probably known all along, you can set a for loop, we'll use variable B, from zero to one, and step zero is the secret. Normally there's a default of step one, if you don't include the step command, just increments B by one each time through the loop. But if you do a step zero, it effectively, well, there's no step at all, and the end condition of this B loop will never be true. B will be zero, and the next time through the loop, it'll add zero, and then B is still zero. It never reaches that end condition of one. So it's effectively an infinite loop. And then we can just print character string, and we'll do the same optimizations, A plus random dot, semicolon, colon, and next. Okay, so there is a one line version that hopefully is competitive. Let's see. That's pretty fast. Okay, 297 jiffies. And we had the other one to what, 253 or something. But that had all that extra unrolling. So can we improve this at all? Now you might think converting these zeros into dots would make a difference. Okay, 297 jiffies, let's try that. Run. Oh, it was actually one longer. That's there's that potential wiggle on the jiffy clock, but basically you see it does not make it quicker. And the reason for that is the for statement is only processed once before the looping begins. So while it might be slightly faster to parse that dot instead of a zero, that only happens once. And then the whole for loop is turned into a stack structure pushed on the processor stack and that's where the for next loop lives from then on and these values are not looked at again like it's not reparsed each time when the next is encountered it actually just looks back on the stack and looks up all this pre-processed information so there's no improvement there now note that this is where the dart really does make a difference because it's inside it adds about 30 jiffies if I was to change that back to a zero, but I won't because I want it to be faster, not slower. So I had the idea, we've got two variables here. How about instead, let's just use the for loop, which has an initialization built into it. There, 205 to five. And then I thought you have to change the two to something bigger, like 206. Okay, so let's try that, 298 Jiffy. 
What? Okay, whoops. Okay, and we also have to change that variable, of course, to an A. <laughs> I forgot that I had it as B. Okay, so now we have a single variable A, and it's being set by the for next loop to 205.5, which is where we need it. And then the step zero will not affect it at all. Okay, so let's try running that. Well, 299 jiffies. So that really isn't getting any faster. But then I realized that actually this number doesn't have to be bigger. Zero isn't considered positive. Now, if it's only if the four and the two values are the same, saying they're both 205.5, then look what happens. It just printed one slash because A, started there after one iteration it checks it is equal and therefore the loop ends but we can change this to something smaller so if we do change it to zero kind of looks wrong 205.5 to zero down but again step is zero it's not negative or positive so let's run that okay 297 jiffy so Really, we're not getting any faster here, but at least we got a little bit shorter by eliminating the second variable. I guess we saved a little memory too. So that's actually the very fastest I can make it, except for science, we will once again try and unroll it just to see how fast we really can go. Uh, can I switch to lowercase again? Yep. For A equals 205.5, Two, oh, I'm going to use dots just because I do like them. ST, Shift E, it just looks so cool. Uh, the abbreviation for step is actually ST, Shift E. If you just do S, Shift T, you get stop. Okay, so we've shortened it up a little bit. Print C, Shift H, A plus R, Shift N, dot, semicolon, colon. And now I have to type this in again. Oh. This is really painful, guys. But it's not as bad as typing on a ZX81. That's like this every step of the way. Print C, Shift H, A plus R. Okay, and next is N, Shift E. So we can fit four unrolled in there. Let's list that. And hopefully we didn't miss anything. Again, shout really loud if I did. Whoops. I hit return on B basic. That's okay. It doesn't, it's just, this isn't a command, so it doesn't recognize it. Okay. I think we're ready to go. We got the one line. Oh, yeah, I'm going to switch back to uppercase. I'm going to run it. Will it work? Woo! Go, go, go. Oh, 261. So, yeah, that did save another about a half a second, but it is still eight jiffies slower than the fastest of Alex's optimized unrolled version. That one is still about eight jiffies faster. <laughs> so, all right, that's the best I can do in a one line, 10 print, optimized for speed. How about you? Can you go faster? I'd love to see something and Again, when I do all these videos, it's not to show how good I am. I really hope that people come up with faster things. And I'll give your comment a like, and I'll even pin it if it's like a legit faster one. There can only be one fastest. Who will it be? It's Robin from the future here with an addendum. I released this video a couple days early for my patrons, and very quickly, both Sean Bebbington and Mager Valp pointed out another optimization in the unrolled versions that I totally missed. The print command, of course, allows multiple expressions to be strung together, so there's no need to add the extra semicolons, colons, and question mark, uh, the print abbreviation, for each expression. This speeds things up even more, and even allows for an extra character to be printed in each loop for a further small gain. So with this extra improvement, the one-line version is now at 246 jiffies, 
or 4.1 seconds. And of course, this can be applied to Alex's code as well, which is still slightly faster at 241 jiffies or 4.02 seconds. That did narrow the gap even more though, just five jiffies apart now. Thanks to Sean and MV for pointing this out. And as if that wasn't enough, MakerValp then went for the ultimate cheat, a one-line basic program with embedded machine language in a REM statement. It runs a ridiculously low 22 jiffies in total just a third of a second. And apparently it can be typed in, so it's legal basic code, if perhaps not really in the spirit of things. Nice work, MV. I'm not going to go into depth explaining that right now. That would take a whole nother video, but cool idea. Okay, back to Robin of the present. Okay, so as I was saying, Benchmark Basic is usable now, and actually I'm having a lot of fun with it, but still more of a proof of concept than anything else, like a first functional release. So what kind of improvements could we do with it? Well, you might not like how the screen automatically clears or how it stops at the bottom of the screen. So maybe we can make all those optional parameters like run colon. And then you could say, you know, clear screen only if you want to clear the screen or whatever. Maybe, maybe it could be configurable. Now, what would be great is if we could have multiple end spots. Like right now we're just limited to this idea of printing something to the screen, one screen full scroll, and then it stops. But actually figuring out the patch, that was actually really challenging, figuring out a clean point where I could insert patches, actually dynamically add the patch and then remove the patch and so on. And just finding this particular point was actually very challenging. Now you might be able to think of other useful points where we could stop and print the results or not even have to stop. Maybe just print the results or store them in memory somewhere for to look up later. And that's all fine. Uh, I'm just saying that it's not trivial, or at least I didn't find it trivial. Maybe you'll find it easier. So I think I'm going to do a patron exclusive video walking through the source code for Benchmark Basic and all the little challenges I had for my patrons that are at the exclusive video tier. That video will become public later and probably in several months uh, to a year. Uh, but also, again, the source code for Benchmark Basic is included on the free D64 that will be in the video description. I'll also put any instructions on there on how to run it. So I don't want to hear your complaining the couple of you who do complain about such things. To disable Benchmark Basic, just hit Stop Restore, and then you can run your program without it stopping. And then just Sys49152 to re-enable it. Okay, so that's it for today. I actually recorded this video twice. It was super painful. Uh, my video capture failed. Oh, that better not happen again or I'll quit making videos. Okay. Thank you, my patrons, for their support. Hugely appreciated. Thank you for watching, and we'll talk to you next time.